you follow the channel, you know we've been busy restoring five black and white monitors made by Pi in the mid 1960s. These will fill the missing spaces in MCR21's monitor stack and give us some spares. Apart from the bad mechanical condition, we've discovered that we've got a blown CRT in one of them. So now we're going to try and make as many good ones out of the stock as possible. If you'd like to play along at home, you can download the manual for these monitors from the MCR21 website. So now, let's pick up where we left off. Right, so the situation now is that we've got the original carcass of the monitor that you saw in episode 1 and episode 2, but we've got the CRT from monitor number 4. Uh, and we're going to see what happens now. Ah, so we've got no... We've got a good CRT, nice bright white line, but we've got no uh, horizontal scan. That's a shame. I'm going to turn that off quick because that's uh, pretty bright, that white line. And we don't want to damage this nice uh, new tube. Uh, OK, that's a bit of a disappointment. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to disconnect the EHT so we don't uh, power the tube up. And I'm going to investigate the line scan. Well, of course, as soon as you connect the test equipment up to the right test points, we get the right voltage waveform, around about 220 volts of pulse there. However, it's very sensitive to the board being tapped. So it's a question now of going around and reflowing some suspicious looking joints on the board until we find the one that's actually causing the problem. Just tapping it is quite difficult to localise it. So I think we're just going to have to reflow pretty much every suspicious looking joint. Right, so now we've got our 220 or so volts uh, line output pulse there. And touch wood, it seems to be reliable. I couldn't really find the dry joint that was responsible. Um, they all look pretty much the same and a bit crusty. Uh, <laughs> but I think I've gripped it this time. So now we can uh, reconnect uh, the EHT and see if we've got a picture. So as we've just seen, uh, the beauty of these monitors is that we can easily disconnect a stage at a time for fault finding purposes. So I've just soldered the EHT uh, power supply um, feed back on and we'll try again. Right, we've got a raster coming up, which is good, but we've got no picture, and we've got no, we've got limited control on the brightness. Now the bright raster turned out to be quite an interesting fault. Uh, I didn't capture this on camera, but I'll talk you through what the problem was using the circuit diagram. If we look at the grid of the tube, that is how the brightness is controlled. The control voltage comes off the wiper of R11, goes through R12 and R13 and R602 on the tube baseboard and onto the grid of the tube. Notice that the junction of R13 and R602 is actually taken back to a terminal on the power supply board labelled plus 100 volts B. Now that's an interesting point there because if you look to the left and, and observe D503, we see that that diode there has got to be reverse biased under normal operating conditions because it's, it's fed from D501 to its left. So no current will actually flow through that and, and to all intents and purposes it plays no part of the normal operation of the brightness control. But when the set is switched off, that diode becomes forward biased and current is allowed to pass through R507 to ground. And what the effect of that is, that it basically quenches the image on the screen quickly to provide, uh, prevent any un, sort of unpleasant bright-ups as the scans collapse. So what I think was happening is that D503 was actually leaking and it was putting nearly 100 volts on the end of the um, junction of R13 
an R602, so that was giving you a bright picture with almost no video uh, visible at all. A temporary fix there was just to put a, a bodge resistor from point D of the circuit board down to ground, and that restored the picture. That's a job to be sorted out properly later on, but it's going to be that uh, D503 is gone leaky. It's all good to get at, so um, everything else on that monitor checked out fine, and we put that to one side and uh, uh, to be fixed. I just had a devil moment. I did have a go at reforming these uh, TCC branded uh, electrolytics. Um, to be fair, they did seem to reform. Uh, the leakage current came all the way down, um, but you could probably tell that these are these are mechanically compromised. There's corrosion. Uh, one of them is actually a little bit moist at the end, so that's definitely leaking electrolytic. And one of them was spectacularly leaky physically after I was just leaving this capacitor uh, for two or three weeks in this container. It's, it's just weed out its entire uh, electrolyte. So there's no way, um, even the ones that seem to reform, okay, no point in putting those back again because they're, they're going to go bad, I'm sure. Um, the smaller capacitors on the board, um, they seem okay. There are different brand of capacitors. Um, at the moment I think I'm going to trust that they're alright. I do have spares for them, but um, I, I think they're okay. And you probably noticed we're in a different location today. That's because we've run out of bench space next door. Uh, and we've got two monitors on the bench. One is the one with the broken CRT, so that's just being used as a donor for spares. And the other one is the fourth monitor, and uh, that's the one we're going to be having a quick look at today, as well as a roundup of some of the other bits and pieces that didn't make it into the other two videos. So at this point, we've got the usual setup of the bench power supply powering the 11 volt power supply in the monitor, and the only board connected is the video input. So all of the capacitors in the power supply have been changed as a precaution, um, plus, because one was leaking and all the nasty green TCC branded caps have been changed as well. Like they've either corroded badly or uh, they've started physically leaking, so they had to go and they've been changed. So we're left with a sort of a, a good starting point to look at the video input stages. And uh, we're monitoring on the emitter of TR103, which is a good place to, to uh, start because it's after the contrast control. And if we have a look at the scope, it's pretty nasty waveform, so uh, we'll have a closer look at that now. And despite this capacitor looking no worse than some of the others that we've seen in the other monitors, which have been absolutely fine, this one, as we can see as we just temporarily connect the known good capacitor, the waveform is perfect. So that's proof positive that that capacitor, despite it not looking too bad, is most definitely faulty. So I've unsoldered both the coupling capacitor for the video input and the sync input. We know that the sync input one is okay um, because it's got really good sync performance and I've measured the video waveform on the other side of the capacitor. We know the other one's faulty because we've seen the waveform bad further down the um, signal chain and I've also double checked that it's bad the other side of the capacitor. But just by doing a visual inspection, both look crusty and horrible and equally likely to be faulty. But what does the meter say? So we'll take one, I don't know which one it is at this point. It's, it's checking for the component and I don't think it's going to find anything there. No, so that, that's not even a capacitor any longer, it's, it's nothing basically. I'm surprised any signal got through that at all. So I think that was the one that was in the video circuit. The other one, which also looks crusty and horrible, 48 microfarads, less than an ohm ESR. That's probably as good as the day it was made. I'll compare it with a new component, which is a 68 microfarad capacitor. That one there. And we'll see what it makes of this. Okay, a lower ESR, it's 0.15 ohms as opposed to 0.88, and uh, the capacitance is obviously higher, it's a 68 nominally, 
so it's just a little bit higher than that. Now frankly the difference in ESR between 0.15 and 0.88 in this particular circuit application is going to make no difference whatsoever so I'm quite happy to put that original component back in. So that's good news because I don't have any other spares uh, of these reversible electrolytics in stock at the moment. Uh, so both components are now refitted. Uh, obviously I will write in the repair document for this monitor that this is an old component but it has been tested. So there will be a bit of history uh, that goes along with it. Now if there is anybody worrying that this is actually a Duff component and I'm kidding myself, um, what I'll do is I'll put the same waveform into the sync input of the monitor and we'll just look at the output of that capacitor on the scope. Video cable in. There we go. Nothing wrong with that video waveform, nothing wrong with that capacitor. And this is our old friend, the resistor, that gave us so much trouble a few years ago uh, when doing these monitors. There was no uh, video waveform at the emitter of TR103, uh, and that, of course, is the usual suspect for that. Now, the internal bulb was OK, and I could see the current varying when the contrast control was operated, but still no video was getting through. Shorting across uh, the resistor resistance element with a, a 300 ohm resistor gave video. So I've changed it uh, for the one that you can see here. But it does give us an opportunity to have a look at the original component, and we can see that there's a date stamp of 1966 week 17 so we can get another indication of the age of these monitors. The component that I've robbed out of the uh, sacrificial monitor, the one with the bad CRT, that's date stamped 1973 and it does look like it's been replaced. So uh, that's another, another little gotcha there. Uh, slightly worrying about this second monitor is that um, somebody's been in here at some point and there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight screws missing that are holding the back panel uh, of this monitor in place. Um, can't think what has led to that, but all that sort of thing does worry me that we might end up with another monitor that's got a, um, a basket case tube or some other reason that, that somebody started to dismantle this and then basically just gave up and didn't even bother putting the screws back uh, in. So. Uh, all those things are a bit of a worry. Right, it's a few weeks later, and this is uh, the second monitor. All of the various boards in here have now been tested and work fine. The only problem is with the power supply. Um, I'm going to pause restoration on this because it's turning out to be a bit more tricky. Um, the high voltage section runs, but over the course of a few minutes, probably about 10 minutes, the voltage starts to droop, the 100 volts and the 500 volts start to droop away uh, and, the, and the supplied current goes up. So uh, I'm wondering whether there's some actual leakage inside the, the main transformer here that gets worse with time. So I'm going to pause that one and we're going to fit this spare one that we got working um, back in uh, the spring of 2021. So that's what it's here for, it's a spare part. We're going to put it in this monitor and see if we can get a working monitor at the end of the day. Right, so we've got the EHT power supply uh, back in place. Uh, I've changed the two rectifier diodes for the low voltage power supply because one of those had uh, blown. So I put two new ones uh, with an uprated uh, capacity in, so that's good. So we've got uh, the monitor running on its internal supply now and if I turn the contrast up we have got an image on the screen. Um, if I switch to the crosshatch generator but we do have a problem with the linearity. The boxes at the top are uh, expanded compared to those at the, the bottom and we have this offset of the picture. Now we have seen that problem before, um, and that in that case it was the vertical output transistor that seemed to um, changing that seemed to fix it. Um, so uh, we can look at that. A couple of other minor things: the uh, power um, light is not working, and the cooling fan isn't turning either. So um, 
some progress on this monitor, but it's not quite ready to be returned to service yet. And the plug showing on the waveform monitors, and also on the production preview monitor, and the waveform monitor above that. So we're reasonably pleased with the afternoon's work.